Merry Christmas, everybody. Hello, hoes. Uh, dude, I think you said that wrong. I said what I said. Okay. Hello? Welcome to the Biodiverse, and welcome back to Paleo Rewind 2022. If you don't know what that is, go ahead and pause and read this now. Otherwise, welcome to the month of June. I will say this is supposed to be a chronological series, so if you haven't seen May's video yet by Benji Thomas, go ahead and watch that first. Otherwise, after this one, you're gonna wanna go over to Prehistorica and watch their coverage of July. Otherwise, Buck and I are gonna take you on a journey through five amazing stories through this month. And let's get the ball rolling. This is a Megalodon. Scary, isn't it? Uh, actually, me thinks that's a great white shark. Okay, funny guy, thanks for ruining my surprise. It's what I do. <sighs> yes, this is a great white, maxing out at around 15 feet on average. This is the Megalodon, a mighty beast of the sea that reached over three times larger than the great white, and it's dead. Now hold on a moment. Some nice gentlemen from the pub have claimed to see it while out crab fishing. No, I don't care what any conspiracy theorist says, it's dead. But that does beg the question, how did it die? Surely it was a combination of many things that we could possibly never know for sure. But a recent study came out and the Great White, it might have actually led to its extinction in part. Now, how could we have possibly known that? Well, there's two nifty techniques that scientists use that really narrow it down to make it seem very plausible. These are known as carbon dating and zinc stable isotope analysis. Now, it's more likely you've heard of that first one, so let's start with that. Carbon dating is a technique used by scientists to determine the relative age of really old things. If someone tells you a T-Rex skeleton is 65 million years old, they probably know this through carbon dating. The way this works is that every living creature has two types of carbon atoms floating around in them. Well, technically it's three, but let's ignore that other one for now. We're focusing on carbon 12 and 14. Don't worry about the source for either one, just know that all living creatures have an equal amount of both within their systems. However, carbon 14 is radioactive. I've read about radioactivity in my books. An invisible demon sent by the devil himself. Bloody hell, get it away! <sighs> Jesus Christ, not everything radioactive is bad for you. What I mean is it's unstable. So over time, it breaks down into other compounds, decreasing the total amount in your body. Carbon-12, on the other hand, does not do this, as this compound is not radioactive. So you might think that means that the ratio between the two changes over time, and you'd be right. For example, if we happen to find a fossil and record the ratio of carbon-12 to 14 as 1 to 2, this means that animal died just under 6,000 years ago. Okay, so that's one of the techniques covered. But what about that zinc thing I said earlier? Well, the easiest way to describe this one is you are what you eat. Just like carbon, every living thing needs zinc to survive. This element aids in bone building, DNA creation, and so on. Animals themselves cannot produce zinc. Only plants can do that. So that means we need to eat things in order to get our bone fertilizer. And that's where trophic levels come into play. Now, this is going to get complex. So just to make things more interesting, I'm gonna be using Danny DeVito here to explain. Trophic levels are basically the tiers within the food chain. So for instance, sunflower Danny DeVito is all the way at the bottom because he produces his own food from the soil and the sun. Snail Danny DeVito then eats the sunflower. He just became a primary consumer. Meanwhile, gopher Danny DeVito hates his greens. But escargot? Now that's something he's willing to indulge in, making him a secondary consumer. Then owl Danny DeVito eats the gopher DeVito, wolf DeVito eats the owl DeVito, wendigo DeVito eats the wolf DeVito, and so on and so on. And this diet is where we get our zinc signatures from. If yellow sunflower has a red zinc signature, then snail boy develops a red signature as well. But sometimes, snail DeVito wants to treat himself to, oh, I don't know, two copies of Sonic the movie on Blu-ray HD, which happens to have a blue signature. Boom, you got a purple signature now. And that signature is written into your bones. As remember, zinc aids in bone development. Okay, cool, I tricked you into sitting through a science lesson and I didn't even play Bill Nye for you. What an asshole, am I right? How does this apply to megalodons and great whites? Well, when you inevitably die. We all do one day. Kids, better you start coping with it now. The carbon decay begins and the zinc signature freezes. So when you take an old megalodon tooth and a great white tooth, you see they're about from the same age. Great whites are by no means a new animal, first appearing in the fossil record around 30 million years ago. And get this. Their zinc signature is suspiciously similar to that of the Megalodon, implying the two titans had the same diet. 
So tell me, what happens when two animals living in the same place at the same time decide to eat the same food? Competition, baby! All right, Pinhead, your time is up. Who you call it, Pinhead? And that's it. The theory is the Great White was able to outcompete the Megalodon and therefore starved it to death. Forget fearing a mythical giant of the seas. There's already a monster here that already slayed that monster, which you'll probably never see in your life, honestly. They don't like humans or anything, and you're not going out into the middle of the ocean, I hope so. You're fine. Yo, two stories for the price of one? You betcha! Next up, we have an Ebelosaurid from Egypt and a Spinosaurid from the Isle of Wight. Two new discoveries within a 24-hour period. Starting with Egypt, we have a vertebrae from a species belonging to Abelosaurid ceratosaurs, a joint family of fairly large bipedal dinos, including members such as Carnotaurus and Abelosaurus itself. They are some of the most widespread dinos living during the Cretaceous period. Their range includes South America, Indo-Madagascar, Australia, Europe, and parts of Africa. However, this is the first time one of these fossils has been found anywhere close to Egypt. It was first discovered in 2016 from the Baharia Formation, a fossil-rich formation within the Baharia Depression of Egypt, which formed during the early Cenomanian period. This particular fossil is believed to be about 98 million years old. And not only is it the first abelosaurid fossil ever found in Egypt, but it's the oldest one ever found, up to this point at least. But what did it look like? Well, Ohio University has an answer for us. According to Bilal Salem and his team, they believe it was about 6 meters tall, with small teeth, tiny arms, and a bulldog-like face. Oh, this! This is beautiful! And so is the White Rock Spinosaurid from the Isle of Wight. Conversely, this specimen is the youngest we have on record for its clade, though it is considerably older than the Abelisaurid at 125 million years old. The magnificent creature is represented by the fossilized remains of its pelvic and tail vertebrae. Another speciality of the creature is it's believed to be the largest land-based hunter to ever roam Europe. In its prime, it likely stood 33 feet long and taller than 15 feet. Quite the big bloke. And they're still looking for a name. Despite being called the White Rock Spinosaurid colloquially, scientists have yet to give it a scientific name proper. I for one vote for Buckus Spinus. A name fit for a king. I believe you've dropped this. And this king's significance doesn't stop there. Large holes were bored into the rock, suggesting some sort of bone-eating lava had found its way to the carcass first. A rare look at the ancient decomposers at work. Oh, how the mighty fall. I relate to that bugger in some ways myself. You know, with my body missing and all. Seriously. I miss my ass. It was eaten by beavers when I was three. Those bloody bastards. You know, I didn't even want to go in the water. But no, me mum said, it'll be fun, sweetie. How's paying medical bills in America for the rest of your life fun? Psst. Hey, you want to know a secret? Bah! Ha <laughs> ha, scared you, didn't I? Well, it's relevant to our next story. Get this! Dinosaurs had belly buttons. Crazy, right? I always thought they were like a mammal thing, but no. Some birds, reptiles, and other amniotes have them too. Though they work differently than ours. The reason you and I have one is because they're scars left over from our umbilical cords. But since those classes come from external eggs, they have no use for such a cord. There's no placenta, but there is yolk. They're only source of food while in the egg. And in order to absorb this, they have to attach themselves to it from their bellies. Some lizards are even born with egg sacs afterwards. However, the sac is only temporary as the animal begins to absorb it back into their body, leaving behind this slit on the stomach that you can see here. But unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, unless you're a mammal. As they age, the mark smooths over, leaving little evidence it ever existed after only a week or two. And because of that, you can imagine how it'd be extremely difficult to determine if dinosaurs had these as well. We knew they were amniotes as well, so we were pretty confident they would have had belly buttons, but we just didn't have the evidence. That is, until now. And there it is, right on the fossilized remains of the Cytocosaurus. Extremely easy to overlook, unless you know what you're looking for. This exact same specimen made the news last year as well, for being the first time a cloaca was observed on a dinosaur. 
What is a cloaca? I'm glad you asked. Us humans have a butthole and a frontal bit, but most birds and reptiles combine the two for efficiency reasons, I guess. And again, we are pretty sure dinosaurs had this as well, we just didn't have the evidence. And I don't think we need to go into any more detail on the cloaca. Please go into more detail on cloacas. So let's move on to our final story. I know you can still hear me. And now we're at the big one. All of those other stories were great, but this one, this is the one. This one made mainstream news and is probably within the top five stories of all year. So without further teasing, let me introduce you to the Yukon Mammoth Calf. On June 21st, two miners working on a site at Eureka Creek within the Klondike Goldfields made the discovery of their lives. Hey! North America's first complete mummified woolly mammoth. It had bones, skin, and even fur. The only other time a North American mammoth mummy had been found was in 1948 at a gold mine in Alaska. But for that one, only an arm and a head were found. This one was the real deal. Quickly, the miners contacted Yukon paleontologist Dr. Grant Zazula to report their discovery, who arrived with his team shortly after. They all gasped upon witnessing the creature. Zazula stated, As an Ice Age paleontologist, it has been one of my lifelong dreams to come face to face with a real woolly mammoth. That dream came true today. This specimen is beautiful and one of the most incredible mummified Ice Age animals ever discovered in the world. I am excited to get to know her more. The team examined the corpse and concluded it was a female calf. They believe she froze within the Yukon ice during the last American Ice Age 30,000 years ago. Size-wise, she's comparable to the Lyuba, the only other complete mummified mammoth discovered. That one was excavated in Siberia in 2007. His measurements were 85 by 130 centimeters and weighed 50 kilos. But this, this is America's story. They named her Nunchoga, meaning big baby animal in the Han language. They estimated she was no more than 35 days old and likely died after being trapped in the mud. Huh? At this time, uh, her whereabouts are kind of complicated. She was technically discovered on First Nation land. I, I'm not going to pronounce it out of respect because I'm definitely going to butcher it. But this land is owned by the descendants of the Han speaking people who have been there for a thousand years. So I'd say they definitely have precedence. And even though Zazula's team did receive their blessings to remove the animal, there's still a whole bunch of legal shenanigans and hurdles that need to be resolved first, but we should receive an update on Nanchoga soon. Overall, it was a month of some pretty extraordinary discoveries. Which story was your favorite? Let me know down below. And hey, before you head over to Prestorica's video, I don't know. If you like Buck and I's video, maybe you could hit subscribe. I mean, you don't have to, I'm not your mom or anything, but I don't know, it'd make me happy, which might make you happy too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for watching.